Yung dad ko namatay siya nung bata ako. Parang empty. I, I felt like, Lord, parang imposible ata. Siyempre, naisipan ko rin po na medyo unfair po sa part ko kasi nakapagtapos ako pero ito po yung trabaho ngayon. Nung, nung time na yun, kinakabahan ako. Sabi ko, God, ano na, natatakot ako. I separated with my wife. That was the lowest point in my life. After noon, bigla ako nawala kasi na bumalay ko sa dati kong ano, hindi magandang gawain. I learned na it's not just a religion but it's more of a relationship with Christ. And I started really getting more into the Word. There were times na ano, na parang gusto ko nang bumigay pero naging encouragement lang sa akin na I have to be strong because God is with me. Pinahawakan ko talaga yung Word ni Lord na everything is possible sa Kanya, nakasama Siya. Sobra talagang may ayos yung line ng buhay mo pag makilala mo talaga si Lord. I think He's got a whole list already of never-ending surprises lined up for us if we choose to continue our devotion to the Lord. Hindi natin kailangan malaman or makita kung ano yung ginagawa Niya. Kailangan natin gawin is to, to trust Him, to have faith in Him. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's always a privilege to be with you guys. Um, I do consider this like a second home, um, so it's always great to be with uh, our spiritual family here. I bring you greetings again from, from Nashville, from our office there, and um, it's just been amazing um, over the last four or five years when I've gotten a chance to visit just to see all that God continues to do in and through this church, um, how the community is growing, how this um, the nations of the world are being impacted, and just thank you guys for all that you continue to sow in faith and in love, and um, just in terms of your leadership to the rest of the world and the leaders here, just so grateful for all that God is doing. So um, before we get in the into the message, I want to introduce you to my family. Um, I know I'm somewhat of a familiar face, but there's probably a bunch of you who've actually not met me. So I want to introduce you to um, my wife. Mashan, she uh, will be celebrating 11 years of marriage in uh, December of this year. And this, yeah, that's, yeah, God is good. It's, um, and so from starting on the left, this is little Justin David. Uh, he's eight years old uh, in third grade. Um, we have a set of twins, uh, Joshua and Chloe, and they are six. And our youngest is Chelsea Rose, and she is four years old. And um, the reason I bring this picture or a picture with me every time I come here is just to remind uh, myself and really to, to just share with all of you that though I appreciate the privilege to help lead Every Nation Music and to work with songwriters globally and to preach the word and all these things, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a husband and I'm a son. And I'm a man who loves God and wants to honor him and continue in the work that he's called me to and, to, um, and ultimately to be a great dad. And, uh, and that I really do mean that. And that's hopefully a little insight into just who I am and who stands before you sharing the word with you today. So um, let's pray and then we'll jump into, uh, into the message here. Father, we're just, we're grateful. We're so grateful, God, that you're so good. Um, you're way better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. And, and Lord, we ask that uh, just as your word says that where two or three of us are gathered together in your name, that you're there in the midst of us. We ask, Jesus, that your transformative presence would be here with us today, God, that you would minister to us, that you would soften our hearts, Holy Spirit, that you would awaken our minds to the reality of who you are. And Lord, ultimately, that as we read your truth, that you would sanctify us in it, that you se separate us to it. And God, that you would do something new and something fresh in our hearts, God. So we just thank you for this time. We pray your blessing upon it. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to... Um, I'm, first of all, it's a privilege to, again, to be here and to conclude this great series. Um, I got a chance to, from, uh, from Nashville to check out some of the videos and listen to some of the podcasts. And it's just been such an amazing uh, series going through the life of Abraham and getting to hear 
um, and see a picture of his story, which I think relates so much to, to our story, the ups, the downs, the challenges, the steps that we try to take to honor God, but sometimes we miss it and we need to be course corrected and just to see the life of faith uh, lived out in this man's story. And we come today to this point in our series where we're talking about unwavering in the midst of testing. So unwavering in testing. And I want to draw your attention to a passage of scripture. We'll have it up here uh, to kick us off. It's actually coming from uh, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and I'm going to read verses 17 through uh, 19 to set this up. And it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. You know, this passage of scripture that we see in Hebrews is actually making reference to a much larger passage of scripture, which we see in Genesis chapter 22, verses uh, 1 through 19, where God speaks to Abraham and he tells him to take his son Isaac, the promised son, the son that he's been waiting for all this time, roughly 25 years he's been waiting for this promised son. He says to take him up to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him. And sacrifice is really just a fancy way of saying to kill him, to kill him. And we see in this passage not just the idea that he wanted to, him to come and to express this um, in this act of worship to, to sacrifice him. But he says in, in Genesis chapter 22, he uses a phrase there. He says, and present him as a burnt offering. And in that context, Abraham would have understood it. That doesn't really make much sense to us here in modern day. But a burnt offering was when you brought something to God that was sacred, that was hallowed for the purpose of worship, and you slayed it and then you burned it. So it wasn't just kill him, but burn him. Imagine the weight of God's words to Abraham. Imagine the pressure that he probably felt in this moment, even still standing in faith, but understanding what was being asked of him. And not only that, but Abraham, we know through the the course of this story, has been through so much. I mean, to this point where God is asking him to make this sacrifice, he's been through so much. Here's just some some overview of of what we've seen so far. And this is in no particular order, and it's not even all of it. But he left his homeland to go somewhere he had never been before. He lies and calls Sarah his sister because he thinks he's going to die in Egypt. He lived through famine. He fought in war. He suffered through family dysfunction with Lot, Sarah, and Hagar. And actually, the most horrible part of the Hagar and Sarah saga is that it caused him to be alienated from his son Ishmael. And on and on and on it goes. And even now, you're probably thinking about your own life. Just as I thought about my own life as I read this story and all of the ups and downs and the challenges. And still God continues to pursue Abraham, to speak to Abraham, to call Abraham, but not without being tested. And he tests him in this moment. And I want to draw three points out from this passage and also through the story in Genesis chapter 22 to help reinforce the idea of what God is after when we go through testing. What is he after? What does he want to solidify in our hearts and our souls about him and about his good purpose? And the first point is testing reveals character. Testing reveals character. It reveals God's character and his divine nature, who he says that he is, But then it also reveals something about our character, who we are in him, what he's forging in us. Every test that Abraham faced made him more sure of God's divine character. God had proven himself faithful through every season of Abraham's life, even when he was unfaithful or even faithless, in fear. God continued to show his great divine character 
through Ab- in Abraham's life and wandering and famine and war and family dysfunction. God spoke to him time and time again and showed that his word was trustworthy. That his word was trustworthy. Now I want to take you into a, a parallel, a modern day parallel of this idea of someone's word being trustworthy or extending ourselves in faith. And hopefully this is something that maybe you weren't aware of, but it'll make sense to you as I tell this, I set, this, set up this story. So let's imagine yourself, and um, many of you in this room probably have some kind of job, you know, work for a company, or there's some kind of employment, or, or at, maybe at one time you've, you've had employment. So you know the employment process is pretty tedious, right? So you, you go into this place, you know, and they have you fill out this job application, and there's all this information, all these details you have to provide them, and then you sit down with, a, uh, with the HR or the interviewer, and they ask you these questions, and they're all trying to sort out whether or not you're going to be fit for the work. And once you go through this extended process, sometimes they can last a month or maybe even more if it's a really significant job, they finally tell you, you have it. We want to hire you. Now, sometime after you being hired, you start your work. Now, this, is, again, is referencing this idea of someone's word being trustworthy. Now, here's something interesting as I studied this and thought about this for myself. Through the whole employment process, you know, one thing that you never actually get through that whole process is money. No one has paid you, not one dime, and you've waited, and you've waited, and you filled out papers, and you showed up when they wanted you to show up, and they told you in two weeks, or maybe even longer, you'll receive a check. You still have not gotten any money, but you are waiting. And you wait with a sense of confidence based upon the word of the company that you will be paid. Now, in a similar fashion, if we, in our finite understanding of life and all the complexities of it, can wait for an employer to tell us that not only do we have a job, but that we will be rewarded for our work, how much more should we rely upon God who's been true from generation to generation? I find in myself sometimes this tension that I'm willing to extend myself in the world around me in ways that I'm not even willing to extend myself in my relationship with God. That I'll hang upon the word of my boss that I'm going to get paid, but sometimes I fail to hang upon the word of a God who's kept his promise from generation to generation. And we see Abraham in this revealing of his character, in the revealing of God's character, his good nature, him being trustworthy and his word being true, him being faithful, that Abraham trusted that who God said that he was and what he had experienced from God previously was absolutely true. He trusted in God's character. Like Abraham, every test makes us more convinced. It should make us more convinced of the purity and trustworthiness of God's character. Every test reveals that character of God and within ourselves. Number two, testing teaches us about true worship. Testing teaches us about true worship. Now, worship was a very, very big deal during this time. Worship, in in modern terms, for us typically means What does our Spotify playlist look like? Worship meant a little bit more to the people in the ancient Near East. And it meant more because during this time, there were all these pagan rituals. There was polytheism. There was idolatry. And one of the significant works of God in bringing together a people who were not a people, which we see represented in Abraham, was this idea of purging this polytheism and this idolatry in their lives so that they could be wholeheartedly devoted to Yahweh, to God. And what we see is that worship 
in this act of Abraham taking his son and marching him up this hill, up to the mountain for him to be sacrificed, is that worship is an all-or-nothing proposition. Worship required that Abraham be willing to surrender the thing that was most precious to him, the thing that God had promised. And we see through this picture that testing teaches us what true worship actually is. That true worship is more than the lifting of our hands and the singing of songs and what is on our playlist and our cars, but worship involves every facet of our lives. That there is no stone that God will not overturn in order to engage in the deepest relationship possible with each one of us. And that's what he desired in his relationship with Abraham, and that is what Abraham was willing to do, to show his singular, wholehearted devotion to his God. It says that he went so far not only to say that he would take him, but that he was in faith that even if he had to raise the knife and slay his son, that God was even willing to raise him from the dead. Look at the faith that's being solidified in Abraham in this relationship that he has with God. So willing, not because of his own goodness, but what he knew about God's character. That God is good, that he watches over his word to perform it, and that he could trust in that. This idea that worship, that testing teaches us true worship. The thing about worship, as we move into this, this, this next point, is that it was commonly understood, and we all would probably agree with this, that worship requires sacrifice. That if there's not something to be sacrificed in worship, it is a relationship of convenience and actually not worship at all that is actually centered around us, how we feel, and what makes it convenient for us, and that draws the attention away from the thing that's being worshiped and back to ourselves. So we understand that because worship requires sacrifice, that if sacrifice is to be done, there must be provision. There must be a provision, which brings us to our third point, and this is where I'll spend the remainder of my time, is that testing shows us our need for God's provision. That we are incapable of providing what is necessary for ourselves. Though we think that we are, and though that we may arrange our lives in a way that says, I am sufficient in myself, I am smart, I am capable, I am strong, I can make the money, I can lead the business, I can figure it out. It's all in my hands when in actuality, we find ourselves time and time again running dry of our own solutions for ourselves. That no matter how hard we try, we still come up short. No matter how much we press into the issues of life, we still find that we are depleted and weak and in need of saving. And this is where God comes and makes the greatest provision. As Abraham takes Isaac up, he turns to Isaac, and Isaac is noticing something. He's noticing (laughs) that okay, we've got the wood and we've got the fire, but we're missing something. Where's the thing that we're going to sacrifice? And the answer is you. But it's not that. That's what we would think. The answer is Isaac is you, but no, Abraham actually says the Lord will provide. He turns to Isaac in that confidence of faith and says, because I know my God, because I've walked with this God, because I know the character of this God, 
I trust that when we get to the moment of sacrifice that the Lord will provide what is necessary for the moment. Do you trust that God will provide what's necessary in the moment for you? Are you still, or are you still coming to the end of yourself and trying to reach out of the depth of the emptiness of the well of your life just to draw out what is remaining? Have you ever seen a dry well? There's lots of like sludge and stuff at the bottom. It looks really gross. And that's what we try to do. The well is dry, and then we take the sludge and try to make something of it. When God wants to fill us afresh and, prov- and give us provision that we could not make on our own. And so Abraham comes to this moment of testing, and he recognizes his need for God's provision. And make no mistake, this is very important because not only when we talk about this idea of provision, it's so significant that at the conclusion of this episode of Abraham's story, he says something about God that we haven't seen in Scripture to this point. He says, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And the thing that's interesting about that is all the stuff that Abraham has gone through, it would be very easy for him to name that moment something else. So this could be the mountain of obedience or the place of obedience, or this could be the place of my very difficult trial, or this is the place of very serious testing. But rather than naming it the things that he had been through, he named it the God who stood in front of him and provided the way out. Jehovah Jireh, because he saw the provision. And here's the most significant thing about this, this foreshadowing is really what it is that we see in this story is that as Abraham is taking Isaac up to offer him as the sacrifice that God was requiring, we see a picture of God the Father leading God the Son to the place of sacrifice to make the greatest provision for all time. We see a picture of Jesus we see a picture of the provision that all of us needed. That we all need. That Jesus being loved by his father offers himself willingly. That Jesus takes, much like Isaac, the wood up with his father for the point of sacrifice Jesus takes the wood of the cross on his back and he makes the trek and he willingly submits himself to something that's unimaginably brutal. But the sacrifice that Jesus would make is the greatest sacrifice that this world has ever known. And it's the provision that each one of us needs, and it's the provision that's foreshadowed in the story of Abraham. We can stand through testing because the ultimate ultimate provision has been made. Jesus, like Isaac, ascended the hill with his father, and he takes those steps. But the story of Abraham shows us that God has chosen. God has chosen to perfect faith in imperfect people. God has chosen to perfect faith in imperfect people. That Abraham and all of his wandering and all of his ups and downs and all of his questioning and his fear and his stress and his warring and the famine and the family dysfunction, everything that's going on, God is perfecting faith in this imperfect man just like he perfects it in us. 
And because of the sacrifice that Jesus has made, we can stand in confidence knowing that God will perfect that work. I want to show you the scripture in Hebrews chapter 6 that underscores this from Abraham's life. But I, I want you to read it with this understanding that we should have this confidence in God. It says this, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. This is important because when there was no one greater to swear by that God's purpose would be accomplished in Abraham's life, and not just in Abraham's life, but to the generations that would come after Abraham, he swore by himself that he would accomplish it. Do you know that God has sworn by himself to accomplish his purpose in your life? Do you know that God, in his own wisdom and in his perfect character, said, I know that you cannot provide for yourself. I know that my purpose and my plan for your life cannot be contingent upon how well you execute it. And because I know that, because I know your weakness, because I know your frailty, because I know your deficiency, because I know that you're weak, I will swear by myself that my plan will come to pass in your life. See, the unfortunate thing about us and the unfortunate thing about Abraham is that we continue to try to insert ourselves into God's narrative. We want to be the hero. We want to make the decisions in our own way. And at the end of it, we want to be the one that stands up and says, I did it! But God says, I will share my glory with no one. And if God is to truly be glorified in the greatest sense of the word, he must be involved in every aspect of the process. And we see this in this scripture that he swore by himself. You, I know you can't do it but it will be done by my power and by my grace, and I will insert myself into the gap on your behalf to make sure that my plan and my purpose comes to pass in your life. Abraham trusted in that. Abraham took his confidence in that. Abraham rose up in that faith considering that even the difficulty of the situation he found himself God would provide for his need. God is radically devoted to our perfection in him. Radically devoted, so much so that he was willing to sacrifice his own son to show us his level of commitment. I want to read one more scripture to conclude and hopefully will encourage us as we go into prayer. But I really do believe that this whole idea of being unwavering, and specifically as it relates to being tested, that God is trying to show us that being unwavering is not determined by how resolute we can be in our own strength. But unwavering is securely planting our trust and our faith and confidence in a God who has maintained his character and his good work and his faithfulness from generation to generation. And it's in that reality that we stand. This last scripture says this in 1 James, I mean, in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 
and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God wants you to be whole. God wants me to be whole. God wants to flourish us in every way. And he understands that our weaknesses will always cause us to shrink back from his plan and his purpose. And so he inserts himself right in the middle of our situation and he says, I will provide. I know you're being tested. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's inconvenient. But what I'm trying to do is reveal my good character. I want you to see who I really am and I want you to see how that is formed in you. That the testing that God brings to us is ultimately for our good. He doesn't take pleasure in our pain. He doesn't rejoice when we're low. His desire is for us to experience his goodness in the most significant way possible. So that testing reveals character and that testing teaches us what true worship is. What that relationship, that living, vibrant, passionate, powerful relationship with God looks like. And then that testing reveals to us our great need for his provision that we need Jesus. We sang a song earlier. We said, you know, I don't have much to bring, but you can have all of me. That's a poetic way of really saying, I have nothing to bring. You might be here today and you're feeling like you're at the complete end of your rope. Maybe it's a work situation, maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's a health issue. There's something that you've been going through that has completely frustrated and depleted you, and you're saying, I don't know where to go. And I've been trying to pass the test, and I continue to fail. And God is saying, because you've tried to answer it in your own way. That our answers will always be insufficient for the test that God brings to us. Because it's always meant for us to look to Him. For us to be found in Him. For us to be strengthened and comforted in Him. For us to flourish in Him. For us to be blessed in Him. For us to be empowered in Him. It begins and ends with Him. So I want to pray in these last few minutes that we have. And I realize that in a room full of people, you're going to have folks that fall all along a spectrum. You're going to have people who are, for the first time, hearing something like this and saying, I've been trying to do it my own way, always. And this is the first time that I've been confronted with the fact that I'm not the hero of my story, that God is. And we would call that salvation. We would call that passing from from death to life. We would call that coming out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, the awareness that you are not the hero, but that God is worthy to be worshiped. That Jesus has made the ultimate provision for us and we can live and move and have our being in that confidence and rest in that provision. Then on the other side of the spectrum, you have people who, you know, you're here and you've been living by faith and walking with God, and, but you've experienced ups and downs like Abraham and one minute you're fearful, the next minute you're full of faith and the next minute you're angry and the next minute this is happening and and up and down and up and down and you're feeling weak, you're feeling depleted, you're feeling spent. 
And regardless of where you fall on this spectrum, I want to pray and trust that God would do something by his spirit that would mark you for the rest of your life. That you would be unwavering. Because you would fully know and rest in the unwavering God. So Lord, we pray. Uh, We ask Lord, that you would come and do only what you can do. Lord, this moment is not about me. This moment is not even about victory as a church. This moment is about you coming to people and revealing yourself in a greater way. So God, I ask by the power of your spirit that you would come and you would comfort and you would guide and you would direct and you would empower, and you would encourage, that you would strengthen, that you would reveal Jesus to us, that we would know you and love you and walk with you in a greater way. For those of us who are here and are making that declaration for the first time of saying, I want to know God, I want to walk with God, I don't want to continue to come up with my own answers and my own ways and my own lines of thinking. And I'm willing to lay it all down. I'm willing to give it all up so I can know him and walk with him and be found in him. Lord, would you meet us? For those of us who are here who are feeling weak and depleted and just at the end of our rope, Would you come by the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you come and would you provide that affirmation and that comfort? That peace in knowing who you are? And Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that there's no one like you. We thank you that from generation to generation, you continue to show yourself faithful. And Lord, finally, I ask, Lord, that this would be more than a moment, that this would be more than a moment. God, that this just wouldn't be another sermon and another service and another gathering and just another day along the string of days in our lives, God, but that you would meet with us and that you would transform us and that you would do something that would mark us for the rest of our lives that every day we would be found in you and every day you would show yourself to be good and that we would not waver and we would rise up in faith. Lord, I thank you for blessing us today with your presence and with the truth of your word. Lord, we will never be the same because of what you've said to us today. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we all stand? How many of you appreciate that word? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. 40 years, more or less, that's really the journey of faith. Abram was called by God 75 years old. They were waiting for Isaac for 25 years. 25th year came Isaac. In this passage, we can assume that Isaac was already a teenager, 15 years old. So 75, 25 years of waiting, plus 15 years. On the 15th year of Isaac, it was testing. 40 years of journeying with God. And I think I get to realize more when we study this scripture, our walk with God is a journey of faith. There will be ups, there will be downs, there will be success, there will be failures. There were dysfunctions in the marriage of Abram for sure. There were mistakes, but you will always see God faithful. Actually, the series title of Unwavering is not because Abram's faith more of, it's actually more of the faithfulness of God that's unwavering. I want to pray for us as we get dismissed that as we journey with God 
our trust level with God will just increase dramatically to the point that we're willing to obey Him and that there's the willingness to surrender even the most valuable thing in our lives. Even our Isaac, we will be willing to surrender that before God because our trust level is dramatically increased. I want to pray for that for each one of us. Lord, bless your congregation, bless your church. As we walk with you each and every day, as we experience your unwavering faithfulness, increase our faith. Strengthen our trust. That we will learn to trust you even if it's hard to obey. We will learn to trust you even if there are things you're asking us to surrender. We will learn to trust because we know, Lord, that it's, this is not just a belief system, a religion. It's a covenant relationship with you. And so, Lord, El Shaddai, Jehovah, Lord Jesus, reveal yourself to us each and every day that we will have a growing relationship with you and that our trust in our faith continue to increase. So, Lord, I pray that even this coming week, Lord, we will see you, we will see your faithfulness move, we will see your promises unfold in our lives, that whatever our situation is, we will continue to cling to you, Lord. So even as, let your righteousness, your peace, your joy be with us, even as we go and do our work this coming week, Lord. Surround us with your presence. Thank you for your word. Help us apply this in our context. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.